It's a pleasure to be here today, uh, September 28th, 2022, morning or afternoon, depending where people are, with participants today, myself, Dan Hammermesh, moderating it, and three panelists who are at a con well, they're participating via Zoom at a conference on the economics of education sponsored by IZA. Panelists are Serena Kanan, who is a professor at Simon Fraser University in Burnaby, British Columbia. Uh, Michele Pavitsare, who is a professor at the University of Geneva, obviously in Geneva, Switzerland. And Andres Barrios Fernandez, who is a professor at the Universidad de las Andes in Santiago de Chile. Welcome, folks. Thanks for being with me. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having us. Pleasure to be here. Okay, let me go around each of you with questions about your paper that you presented at this conference or are presenting, but not really about the paper, rather some things to think about what they imply. So, Serena, your paper, which I thought was quite, quite neat, says you put kids into a high achieving classroom, they will do better in that classroom and later on, okay? And in the example you use, kids are put into classrooms based upon test scores. Now, I could think of other ways of doing that. I mean, prior teachers' evaluations or maybe the kids' prior performance in classes. Might those be better? What do you think? So, yes, there are other ways of doing this. And I think in a lot of educational systems, they do use other measures in order to put kids, uh, to separate kids based on uh, achievements, essentially. So I know, for example, in France, back in the days, I don't know now if this is still the case, they used to use uh, teacher and principal subjective evaluations uh, in addition to past academic performance in order to separate students, not into different classrooms, but to, into different uh, tracks. So you, the European tracking system is a bit more rigid than you would expect uh, to see in the US, for example. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there's, uh, it's hard for me to say what would happen if we were to change uh, the way students are assigned uh, but you can see positives and negatives. For example, let's take teacher subjective evaluations. It's possible that teachers can evaluate not just students' academic achievement, but also things like their non-cognitive skills, their personality traits, which are things that also predict future academic success. In some cases, some argue that these personality traits are better able at predicting future academic success, success than uh, test scores. And so if teachers are able to capture these personality traits uh, and assign students who can be successful in, in the future to the high achieving classrooms, then we might expect uh, students to benefit even more from high achieving okay. classrooms. Which would be fairer, the students? The test approach or an approach based on subjectives or prior grade point averages? since we care tremendously about fairness these days and in general. Uh, so I, this was uh, going to be my next point and that okay. teacher evaluation can be like uh, not very fair for students because you can see that teachers could be susceptible to biases. For example, you can think of situations where parents, especially high SES parents, could lobby teachers to have their kids be uh, in the high achieving classrooms. Teachers could also have uh, stereotypes, and this has been documented in the data. So sometimes, for example, there is this misconception, even among teachers, that boys are better in math. And so if teachers have these stereotypes, they might be pushing more to have boys uh, into the high achieving classrooms. But then I would argue that test scores are not necessarily that non-discriminatory <laughs> either. Uh, there is evidence that suggests that the way tests are designed, especially things like the SAT or like uh, standardized exams, uh, they do favor people who have who come from higher socioeconomic uh, backgrounds as well. Um, so I think I don't think that I have a definitive answer to the question of what is the best way to assign students to classrooms, but I would think a mix of both. Uh, Past student test scores and teacher evaluation could be not the most, maybe the most fair way uh, 
uh, to assign students to the classroom because it could have the advantage of having us uh, capture students who do well in terms of academic achievements, in terms of objective measures such as exams, but it also have, could have the benefit of capturing students who could have certain personality traits that allow them to excel in those high achieving classrooms uh, as well. Okay, as I figure, there's no definite answer, that's what you're really saying, which is fine. I mean, a lot of problems in the real world, there is no definite answer. Let me move on to Michaela's paper who deals with STEM and uh, uses a very cute idea. I think it goes back to David Card's work on proximity to college, saying that uh, if you're near to a university that offers STEM as a field of study, you're more likely to go there. And it's true in, I think it was Italy you used, is that right? Okay, well, that makes sense for Italy. But what about a place like the U.S. where we have STEM majors? I mean, you know, there are 3,000 colleges and universities here. Would this make a difference in the U.S., which is also a more mobile society, maybe? Well, maybe not, and maybe not even in Italy, in the sense that what we use in the, in the paper is a historical variation in the availability of, of uh, colleges uh, in, uh, in, in the country. Uh, so if we only use the current uh, cross-sectional variation in the availability of, uh, of uh, um, uh, colleges in, in STEM and non-STEM areas, uh, we'll probably not be able to identify much because in most areas of the country, you would have uh, uh, easy access to both types of, uh, of, uh, of fields. Now, what, what we say in the paper, and I you know, to, to some extent, I think, is, is the reason why there is a bit of a revival in the use of college proximity is that this is this is just the proxy for variation in costs. So the specific geographical variation we use, we try to argue, uh, we try to document, corresponds essentially to the difference between commuting to uh, the college as opposed to moving there, so changes your changing your place of residence. And that's a pretty substantial uh, yeah. sort of difference in costs. Uh, and uh, so, so we try to argue that our results can be generalized to a variety of policies that may change the cost of going to college in this uh, sort of uh, range of, uh, of, uh, of variation, which is, uh, which is substantial. Uh, Let me ask this then about that. I mean, okay, clearly these days, the infraction of people who might be affected by this can't be very great. But there is tremendous, especially in the U.S., tremendous heterogeneity in the quality of different colleges. And I wonder if proximity to a good quality place, I mean, living next door to Harvard rather than living, I don't mean to be nasty, next door to Tarleton State University, just to pick one not at random, you've never heard of it. Uh, would that matter? And what can one do about that, if anything? Well, I guess the honest answer is that uh, our paper and our results do not have uh, much <laughs> to say about this. I don't think we can extrapolate to that. Uh, I, I, you know, if you want my gut feeling, it, it probably matters. Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to say whether it matters more or less than uh, the differences in costs. Uh, but uh, but it presumably matters, I guess. Yeah, I mean, if I have to extrapolate from results that uh, from the evidence we know about the heterogeneity in the labor market returns of going to a high quality versus a low quality uh, school or, or or college university, uh, I you know uh, we know that this matters in terms of uh, of labor market outcomes. So it probably matters for choices too. Uh, so that's, uh, but yeah, the, the, the paper we presented today, I don't think has a lot to say about this. True, but this discussion elides beautifully into Andres's work where he shows the tremendous intergenerational transference of elite education and all the benefit that goes with that. And I mean, we know this happens. I've not seen that demonstrated so very clearly uh, as in this paper, which I like very much. But the problem is why this occurs. Is it the school itself? So, I mean, 
I go to Harvard, my child goes to Harvard, my grandchildren go to Harvard, none of which is true, by the way. There's no Harvard degrees in my family. Or is it the parents pushing the kids? Is it parental success being demonstrated? Why is this happening? Yeah. Rather than the simple fact of the what. I want to know the why. Any thoughts on that, Andres? Sure. Uh, great question. Let, let me maybe give a, a little bit of, of context of, of the paper, and, and then I'll uh, address that, that question. But uh, we have known already for a while uh, that uh, on top of human capital, social capital gives you important advantages in the labor market. And there is evidence showing this uh, in Chile, but also in the US. Basically, the idea is that even if you attend a very selective uh, university, uh, still uh, we find uh, huge differences in the labor market trajectories of uh, students depending on their social origins. Um, our paper, as you say, shows that uh, there is a lot of persistence in these uh, trajectories uh, and, and in what we call uh, in, the, in the social capital uh, elite, right? And uh, elite institutions clearly play a role in transmitting social capital. Now, on the uh, positive side, uh, our paper shows that individuals who don't come from an elite background, but manage to gain access to these uh, selective higher education institutions, uh, they have the chance to join the social elite in the next generation through their children, uh, right? Um, and uh, what is behind that? Uh, what we show in the paper is uh, that more than changes on the labor market trajectories of the parents or more than changes on uh, the uh, human capital they accumulate through college, what is key is their exposure to uh, high status individuals. Uh, so we find uh, that by attending these elite institutions, they become more likely to marry high status individuals uh, but not only that, uh, also they become friends and they generate connections uh, with the traditional elite. And this uh, gives them some clues on what are the paths through uh, which they can uh, access or through which their kids can access uh, this world. Okay, so, let me ask you now, let me ask you now, since you have in the background a picture of downtown Boston and just over your right shoulder off the picture is Harvard University. As you know, okay, it's not quite in the picture. Now, what does your work tell me about Harvard's defense in favor of quotas on Asians and Harvard's well-known tremendous preference for so-called legacies, the children of alumni? What does your work tell me about that? This is, a, as you know, a very important case. It's probably going to the Supreme Court someday soon. Yeah. Um, I mean. I think that um, legacy enrollment and uh, policies that allocate places not necessarily based on, on academic merit uh, have the risk of creating uh, 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 fair, unfair advantages and make some of these uh, patterns that we find in the persistence of social capital uh, stronger, right? Uh, the setting that we study uh, is Chile, and uh, in the Chilean setting, uh, college admissions uh, only depend on your academic performance, both in high school and in a college admission exam. Uh, so it is free to some extent from this legacy enrollment uh, uh, concerns. Uh, but even in this setting, we find uh, a lot of uh, uh, persistence in, in social capital, right? So um, what I will say is that uh, more broadly, we really need to think carefully on top of academic maths on, on how to build a communities that are more integrated, where like people from different backgrounds can come together and build links uh, between them, because uh, that seemed to be uh, super important for our results. And I think that it's something uh, uh, more universal than uh, what is going on uh, as in, in the Chilean specific case. It certainly is. All right, look, there's a conference going on today, tomorrow, maybe on Friday, with all kinds of papers about whether this works, that works, what we should do, blah, blah, blah. And actually, I'm going to a seminar tomorrow, but Columbia, 
where some guy from Norway has another one where he evaluates some little innovation. So my question is, we all want to improve the quality of education somehow defined. All these improvements cost money. There's no free lunch on this. So I'm asking each of you to tell me, what do you think the most effective way might be to improve the quality of university of edu education? That's the most cost-effective way. And they go around the room, starting with Michele. Oh, university education or education in general? No, university education. Let's be specific here. Uh, university education? Yeah, uh, give me one thing. Uh, teacher pedagogical training. <laughs> I didn't... I, so I didn't expect it. It's a great idea. You mean I, I think, have to get trained as uh, in pedagogy before I, 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 I PhD. think we are uh, breeded as academics a lot with this idea that you're either born a good teacher or you're born a bad teacher. And there's very little you can do about it. And in the end, what matters is how good you are as a researcher when you are at university, or well, most uh, academic institutions. Uh, I, and, and I think this is wrong. I think we have enough evidence uh, showing, not so much for university teachers, I think, uh, but most of the evidence is, uh, is for you know, uh, uh, school teachers of different uh, uh, levels, that, that training matters. And, uh, and I think the training we get as teachers is, is very poor. I, I don't know about your experiences, but, uh, you know, anecdotally collecting the experiences of uh, other colleagues. Uh, sometimes as PhD students, we might have been asked or, or forced to participate in a couple of uh, sessions where they teach us a few uh, pretty useless, in my experience, things about, uh, you know, talking in public and so on. Uh, and as professors, I didn't get any uh, training, actually. Uh, so, so it's no different in the U.S. Believe me, in Yale in the late '60s, there was I was just thrown into a classroom with 30 honors freshmen with no prior experience or instruction. And that is one thing. The other thing that I think could make a big difference yeah. is low, uh, reducing uh, uh, course turnover. So, in my experience, it takes. Uh, but again, anecdotal evidence talking to colleagues, I don't know what is your experience. It takes a minimum of three years, I would say, to uh, 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 sort of develop, create a class, a course that is good enough. Yep. First year you teach a new class, you know, maybe not a complete disaster, but uh, lots, of, lots of room for improvement. Second year, so, so third year, you're kind of in an equilibrium. My feeling always has been that the third year is the year I get it right. Right. <laughs> uh, before then, there's hopefully an upward grade. One just helps one get when one gets it right. It doesn't after a while start going down again. All but right. We're, we're I, changing programs all the times, and uh, right we're often asked. You know, I, I've rarely taught the same class for more than three years. So, uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, limiting. Uh, a turnover of teachers over uh, courses, classes, uh, can probably make a difference. It's, a, it's an interesting idea. Since I taught the same class for 49 years, of course, it kept <laughs> on evolving. And I thought I got pretty good at it eventually. Anyway, Andres, you're being a bit more junior than Michele. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I guess one of the biggest changes that the university system has experienced over the last decades is a uh, uh, complete change on the profile of the students that they are educating. Uh, now it's much more common. They are dealing with like first generations. Uh, and um, yeah, just not to repeat like on Michael's points, uh, I, I think that um, programs providing uh, support to students in both to make really informed decisions on uh, the potential quality of the maths uh, uh, that uh, they will have with in, in the specific colleges and majors. And then I guess uh, once they are in college uh, as well, uh, providing some guidance in choosing subjects, in uh, knowing or being aware of which support tools there are available if they are struggling. Uh, I think that's uh, 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 
yeah, a, a big challenge uh, for us because if you come from a long tradition of university educated, like uh, families, let's. So university education or education in general? No, university education. Let's be specific here. Uh, university education. Yeah, uh, give me one thing. Uh, teacher pedagogical training. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't expect it. It's a great idea. You mean I, I think, had to get trained as uh, in pedagogy before I, 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 I PhD. think we, we are uh, breeded as academics a lot with this idea that you're either born a good teacher or you're born a bad teacher. And there's very little you can do about it. And in the end, what matters is how good you are as a researcher when you are at university or at most uh, academic institutions. Uh, I, and, and I think this is wrong. I think we have enough evidence uh, showing not so much for university teachers, I think, uh, but most of the evidence is, uh, is for you know, uh, uh, school teachers of different uh, uh, levels that, that training matters. And uh, and I think the training we get as teachers is is very poor. I, I don't know about your experiences, but uh, you know, anecdotally collecting the experiences of uh, other colleagues, uh, sometimes as PhD students, we might have been asked or or forced to participate in a couple of uh, sessions where they teach us a few uh, pretty useless, in my experience, things about uh, you know talking in public and so on. Uh, and as professors, I didn't get any uh, training, actually. Uh, so and it's no different than the U.S. Believe me, at Yale in the late '60s, there was I was just thrown into a classroom with 30 honors freshmen with no prior experience or instruction. And that is one thing. The other thing that I think could make a big difference yeah. is low, uh, reducing uh, uh, course turnover. So, in my experience, it takes. Uh, but again, anecdotal evidence talking to colleagues, I don't know what is your experience. It takes a minimum of three years, I would say, to uh, 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 sort of develop, create a class, a course that is good enough. Yep. First year you teach a new class, you know, maybe not a complete disaster, but uh, lots, of, lots of room for improvement. Second year, so, so third year, you're kind of in an equilibrium. My feeling always has been that the third year is the year I get it right. Right. <laughs> uh, before then, there's hopefully an upward grade. One just hopes one gets when one gets it right. It doesn't after a while start going down again. All but right. We're, we're I, changing programs all the time. And uh, right we're often asked, you know, I, I've rarely taught the same class for more than three years. So, uh, you know, uh, I think that a limiting uh a turnover of teachers over uh, courses, classes, uh, can probably make a difference. It's, a, it's an interesting idea. Since I taught the same class for 49 years, of course, it kept on evolving. And I thought I got pretty good at it eventually. Anyway, Andres, you're being a bit more junior than Michele. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I guess one of the biggest changes that the university system has experienced over the last decades is a uh, uh, complete change on the profile of the students that they are educating. Uh, now it's much more common. They are dealing with like first generations. Uh, and um, yeah, just not to repeat like on Michael's points, uh, I, I think that um, programs providing uh, support to students in both to make really informed decisions on uh, the potential quality of the maths uh, uh, that uh, they will have within in the specific colleges and majors. And then I guess uh, once they are in college uh, as well, uh, providing some guidance in choosing subjects, in uh, knowing or being aware of which support tools there are available if they are struggling. Uh, I think that's uh, 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 yeah, a, a big challenge uh, for us because if you come from a long tradition of university educated like uh, families, let's say, uh, and you will know how the system works, but but it's much more difficult when it's the first time and when you don't have that many people around you who have gone through that experience. So I think 
uh, programs trying to provide that uh, support and guide the guys every step, uh, especially in the first years, can be important. Serena, any thoughts? Yeah, uh, uh, I'm going to reinforce what Andres said, which is basically, I think, uh, one uh, class of interventions that has been shown to be working quite well is providing students in college with coaching and mentoring. Uh, and this can take on various different forms. Uh, so we have programs that are quite intensive, and so they provide students with one-on-one -on -one coaching continuous coaching throughout uh, the first year or the first few years of college. Uh, and the coaches can advise students on many different things, like what courses to take. Uh, they can help them build some skills like time management skills and so on. Uh, and these programs have been shown to be quite effective at reducing student dropout rates from colleges. Hmm. Uh, the issue is that they sometimes can be a bit expensive. Now, on the other hand, we have interventions that are also coaching interventions, but they're done via uh, online or through emails or text messages. Now, these are very uh, inexpensive, but they're also uh, not effective at all. Uh, so I'm going to plug in my own paper, which my co-author presented in this uh, workshop as well. So we kind of look at a program that is a medium kind of way that's halfway between the low cost, uh, non-effective interventions and the very uh, intrusive coaching programs. Uh, we basically show that uh, students who are placed on academic probation, if you give them uh, exposure to a workshop that is led by coaches, and in that workshop, you allow them to see that uh, the workshop is basically aimed at improving their self-confidence, at, at building certain skills, such as time management skills. What we show is that this two-hour workshop that is very uh, cost-effective, actually, uh, that is targeted towards students on academic probation can actually have substantial effects. So it reduces their dropout rates, it increases their graduation rates, and we also show that it has effect on their earnings later on in life. So it actually increases their earnings. And so from my perspective, I think that providing some form of coaching or mentoring while in college uh, could be a very effective and less costly ways uh, than other things to actually improve substantially student outcomes. See, all of the things you folks are suggesting, I think, are wonderful. And they are quite low cost, all of them. There's one cost, though, and this gets to my final question, which I'd like a quick response from each of you on. There's one cost which we haven't brought up, and that is, to me, the remarkable inertia of universities and resistance to any kind of change. Now, maybe it's different in Chile or Canada or Geneva, but I sincerely doubt it. So these things all are good, I believe, and they're cheap, and yet... Can you get university administrators to move, do you think? A quickie, Michele, then Serena, then finish with Andres. I agree with you. And, and uh, Switzerland, I think, is, a, is a, an important. <laughs> Switzerland is a, a decently, uh, you know, generally well-run country. And so it operates under the assumption that things are pretty good. And so if you try to change something, people are very resistant because they start from the assumption that, you know, the current status quo is, is pretty okay. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of resistance to change. Uh, so it, I, I don't know. I think it only takes a lot of effort. Uh, motivated people uh, who are willing to, you know, go the extra mile and, uh, and uh, you know, it, 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 it takes a lot of effort, at least in, 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 my, in my institution. Takes a lot of effort. We manage to do things, uh, but uh, but it takes a lot of time and effort. And either you're willing to do it, or it doesn't happen. Serena, yeah, I agree. I think uh, it's not just there's resistance to change. Even when change needs to happen, there's uh, sometimes resistance to listening to kind of like evidence based policy. Uh, so a lot of times, like the administrators want to implement the change. And so they just implement the change that they think. Uh, that's my previous experience, at least from a previous <laughs> university, not my current university. Uh, so they implement whatever they think is the best way. And they even if they're shown evidence against it, uh, they sometimes refuse to listen to it. But I do have to say that this is, I think, institution specific. 
uh, like the program that we look at that I just discussed, this was a program, uh, the coaching program that was implemented by the university itself. We're not the ones who basically came up with the program and implemented it. And I think a lot of universities, especially in the US, maybe more in California, are kind of noticing this problem of persistent uh, low graduation rates. Uh, and many of them are actually starting to implement maybe low cost intervention to reduce th this problem. Uh, some of them <coughs> also are looking for ways uh, to reduce this problem as well. So I think uh, the path is slow, but I think there is uh, some hope. <laughs> I'm glad the young are optimistic. Andres, do you agree with her or do you, are you yeah. already spoiled about this? I think I might be even more optimistic. Uh, <laughs> I guess um, yeah, my impression is that, uh, at least for what I've seen in the US, in the UK, uh, here in South America, um, students and uh, recent graduates uh, are making much more noise uh, and criticizing some things that are, are not working right with the higher education system. We were mentioning before some of these scandals that have affected admissions at Harvard, but it's not only that. There was another cor big corruption scandal in, in admissions in the US. Uh, and um, I think that the fact that now uh, these topics are more present in the public debate uh, offer us also like really good opportunities to talk and uh, get like better reception uh, 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 from the universities uh, when, when you propose changes and when you propose uh, even like running and studying some interventions. And I don't know if it's only for that, but my experience working with uh, universities, with policymakers, with administrators in different settings is that uh, they're really interested in <laughs> learning uh, what they can do to improve their outcomes. And uh, it's not only us, like I see tons of researchers uh, starting like new projects uh, in which they are really working together uh, with different relevant actors. And uh, yeah, I'm like really optimistic on what we are going to learn on the next years. I think it's true, we need a lot of energy to keep like this uh, agenda and to push for, for, uh, for this to being a, a, a thing. But, uh, but yeah, uh, I'm happy with what I've seen, uh, what I've seen at least uh, around me in these few years in the profession. <laughs> Very gratifying. I mean, I'm really pleased that it's the younger two members of the panel who seem more optimistic than Michele or myself, who are more senior. And I think it's important for this industry, which after all is our industry, that the young people who are coming up think at least something can be done. Folks, look. Thank you for being with me this morning or afternoon or evening, whichever it is where you are. I think it's all three of them, in fact, for us. And uh, good luck at the rest of the conference. Thank you. Very, very Thank nice you very talking much. to you. Thanks for being here. Bye, guys.